You're listening to Power Producers Shop Talk, where we are refining and redefining the sales game by equipping you with the tools you need to differentiate yourself in the marketplace. Well, it's like when we audit the mod with Magic and give them the action items that they're going to use to lower their total cost of risk. Tactical skills that will help you provide deliverable value to your clients and prospects. Technology is not an expense. It's an investment. Look at what ThinkHR has done for our clients and even our team. It's an amazing product, and I'm so thankful we have that. And action items that you can provide to take your prospects and clients to the next level. Things are changing for us in 2021. Not all big business anymore. Now that we have Cover Wallet on our team, it's amazing that we're going to be able to write small business profitably. This is Power Producer Shop Talk. Production redefined. Are you ready to feel the power? What's up, Power Producers Nation? We are here with the second episode of the Gurley episodes of Shop Talk with Mr. Josh Gurley. We are batch recording today. Kyle is in Washington, D.C. on some R&R. So... I replaced him with the most suitable replacement I could possibly find, Mr. Josh Gurley. And listen, people, if you like what you're hearing on these shop talks, you got to pay attention to my man on social media. He's got some things coming down the pipeline that he's going to release that you're going to want to pay attention to, specific to some of his processes for building niche markets. But more importantly, before any of that happens, he is going to be live doing a breakout session at Innovation 2021 here in Tampa, Florida an event that I'll also be at, I'm also speaking at, and I'm a little bit worried I'm going to get upstaged. So if you haven't made your reservations and the the idea that you're going to come a reality, it's time to do that because it'll change the way you play the game for sure. So last episode, we talked about setting the table, and you came out of the box really strong with something that caught my attention, and that was the one-liners that producers use. I I love it. Kyle, like, Kyle and I very rarely record that, but we are so sarcastic about it offline that I just think it's a great time for us to to, to do it. So set the table, man. This is your episode. <laughs> well, you know, David, I think everybody's got to have uh, a good one-liner, and, and you have to be able and willing to, to share it with people. Because like I always say, these are people, man. Pe- people like to joke around that, you know, you don't have to be – all business, all serious, all the time, and it's good to break stuff up with a laugh. I'll say this: the thing about the talk of innovation, I kind of, I kind of think that I'm like the appetizer. I'm like the little, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like the little, uh, the the little tuna tartar. Let's just say, hey, ain't nothing wrong with that. I make that my meal plenty <laughs> of times, man. I'm, I'm, I'm like the tuna tartar, and you're the surf and turf, man. So, uh, yeah, I don't know about I, all that. I'm looking, I'm looking forward to. Uh, to getting to hear you talk in person and everybody at innovation uh I, it's my first time being there uh one of the best things that happened to me through covid was finding iaoa and uh and the friends and, and relationships that i've made in there so that's been awesome but one-liners um dude i'm gonna just go ahead and i'm gonna throw out well go ahead i'm not gonna do it i won't do to you what i do to kyle keep going <laughs> well i had a really good one-liner yesterday on a call though so i'm just like busting at the seams to share it but i'm gonna let you roll can i and let, let me just say this first i mean so, some of these one-liners like like uh you know old life insurance salesmen you know they say things like term insurance term insurance is only good if you get lucky and die right there's nothing else you can do with it but die and you know all the dave ramsey fans don't come after me uh on on that i'm not talking about about term insurance but we're just talking about stuff that producers say but one of my favorite things to say to people is, um, well, that sounds like the quote, hope and hope method to me. You people, they go out, they get a quote, they ask you if they can give you a quote, they they hope uh, that their quote is cheaper, uh, and, and they hope they get the business, and they hope to God that the other guy did it right, because all they're doing is copying and pasting what the other person did. That's one of my favorites. Yeah, the, one of my favorites from Josh Gurley is the hump in your leg. Uh, <laughs> I don't know exactly how you frame it, but talk about that for a second. Well, so uh, people, they, uh, you know, we've conditioned people to call 120 or 90 days out, right? And 
everybody seems to get really interested in your insurance program uh, about 120 or 90 days out. And they want to shower you with gifts. They want to call you. They just want to be so nice. Um, but I'm not going to hump your leg, right? I'm not that little doggy that's going to come in the room and, and hump your leg and, and just tell you everything that you want to hear. So I hope that I can get your business. So my one-liners are usually more offensive than they are defensive, right? Like I, I go in in so, – so mine yesterday and, – and it's funny, man, because I use a lot of movie references, but they're all from the same time period, like the eight years I was in college because I watched a lot of movies, but I didn't go to a lot, of, a lot of class most of the time. But I will tell you people – it's done well for me in my professional career. The longer path, you know, and being able to experience the, the social aspect has paid exponential dividends, not even multiples. But I was on a call with a group yesterday, and they were concerned. This thing is just, it, it, it's a train wreck. Absolute train wreck. There was an issue with the workers' comp class code. They were asking me how I would do this, how I would do that. And basically I said, look, fellas, I need to pick up the phone and call an underwriter and find out if anybody's even interested in what you do. And I need to talk to them about the class code you're in versus the class code you think you should be in. And you need to understand that if this thing goes down to an NCCI audit, it's basically going to be the equivalent of binding arbitration. You know, they're going to come in. They're going to say, nope, this is the class code that it's going to be, and you can't change our mind because we make all the rules, right? And so, and, and I said, I've been down that road before, and that's your last resort. Let's figure out if we can get this thing worked out, and it's just a simple misunderstanding from the carrier about what you people are doing. And their first question out of their mouth was, well, is our, is our existing agent going to find out? And so I immediately asked him, I was like, well, why are you talking to me if you're worried about your existing agent? I mean, if they were capable of helping you, then why aren't they helping you? Like they're the, and I said, I don't, I don't want to sound brash, but they're kind of the reason you're in the trouble you're in right now. So, you know, reach out to them. They're like, well, we just, we don't, you know, we don't have a problem moving all of our business to you and everything else, but we want to handle that the right way. And I, and the line I told them, I'm like, I'm like the Kaiser Sose of the insurance world. I'm going to operate in the shadows, and this, this agent will never know what's coming until you give them the death blow. I said, trust me, there's no way that they're ever even going to know I exist. I'm a figment of most people's imagination. I said <laughs> that to them. They both just started dying laughing. And so, you know, listen, people, that accounts probably all lines in twenty twenty five thousand dollars $25,000 in revenue. And I'm dropping usual suspects lines out of it. I mean, but but I think that's the thing, man. You, you have to have those one-liners. And I've got a ton of them. I say them on the podcast all the time. One of my biggest ones at the point of sale is, I'm not here to sell you a product. I'm here to help you solve problems. And I think that that's a big differentiator because everybody else is trying to sell a product. When we had Kevin Ring on, you know, talking about uh, work, workers' comp at a, a deep level, Kevin started in by ta using the doctor analogy, right? Where he says, it'd be like going to the doctor and saying that your knee hurts a little bit and immediately they want to cut you open and do surgery. <laughs> and, and I took that to a, a completely different level. I was like, yeah, well, if that doctor was also an insurance agent, he wouldn't just say, I'm going to cut you open to do surgery. He's going to say, and we're going to cut open the other knee and check that out. We're going to look at both of your shoulders. And I mean, that's the way we think when we go in. And that's the problem. We don't take the time. Like we talked about in the last episode, we don't take the time to just sit down and learn and then figure out a treatment plan. We go in with a preconceived treatment plan before we ever walk in the front door. And it's heavily weighted on the placement of an insurance product. Well, here's a good one-liner to go with that. 80% of the people will sell you as much insurance as you'll buy. That's yeah. true. From the, from, the, from the very start, I mean, that, you know, you, you have avoidance, you have contractual risk transfer, um, you know, you have retention, and then finally you have insurance. But 80% of the people, they don't even know what the first three are, and, and then they skip to the very last one. I'll give you a really good example. So we have a uh, a pretty large manufacturing client that has several several hundred employees and um, and this this particular manufacturer they 
they have distributors that, that sell their product um, all over the country. And one of the things that we uh, recommended to our client was a distribution agreement that, that says that you have to have this contractual risk transfer in place. And so we asked for you know, additional insured and we asked for waiver subrogation. And we had insurance agents I mean, this person probably had 50 to 70 distributors. We had insurance agents from all over the country calling us saying, like, why, why in the world are you asking us for this? I said, well, it happens every single day in the construction world, and you have the opportunity to modify their product, right? Because this is a product that can be customized, you know, by, by some of these other, other dealers that are out there. And so if you change this product in, in any way, then we need to know uh, that you have insurance. And then we want to be an additional insured on your policy because we want to put some space between whatever the event happens and, and us. And so um, I just think that those are things, David, that they get overlooked so much. And, and you can lead into these, these things that we're talking about with just – just kind of funny little one-liners and, and I think that it kind of it'll lighten the mood a little bit but it is a very serious you know subject when that risk transfer is not in place yeah I'm trying to think of some other good ones that I've had over the course of my career where I've I've pretty much just taken a jab at somebody um, I had one one time it was a it was a manufacturer specifically for mattresses and we did the entire presentation and the president of the company was in there and he um, he pushed back and he said, look, I think you're a really nice guy. I just don't think you're the right guy for us. Now, I'm not used to hearing that. OK. <laughs> and so that that number one, it pissed me off. But I tempered my immediate response to just be like, all right, loser, I'm out, you know. <clears throat> but I, I tempered my response and, and, and I thought to myself. This is interesting. And so what I did was I ended up apologizing. I just said, look, I said, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I owe you an apology. I've done an ineffective. If you don't think that I'm the right person to hire you or for you to hire, I did an ineffective job today of interviewing, of you hearing what you needed to hear from me. And I said, part of that has to do with the fact that maybe we didn't discuss things that were germane to this conversation that maybe we should have. But I, I, I just I apologize because I'm going to respectfully disagree. I, I do think I'm the right person based on everything that you've said. I said, why don't you give me some reasons? Tell me, tell me why. And so he starts going into this. And I had a couple of my producers with me, and I had an account manager. So it wasn't like I was just getting sent out to pasture by myself where I could come back and make up a story as to what really happened when I got back to the agency. I got witnesses now, so I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to backpedal and figure this thing out. And I said, tell me, tell me what the deal is. And he said, you know, he goes, your comp he goes, it's down to two groups. It's you and it's a much larger firm. And the much larger firm came in and they had their in-house claims person. They had their in-house loss control person. They even brought a millennial data scientist. And I said, what the heck is a millennial data scientist? And yeah. he said, well, it's a data scientist, but the kid's a millennial. And I said, okay. And I said, well, I've got a risk analyst in my office, but she's got a bad personality and is horrible with people. So we let her stay with her spreadsheets in the office and don't take her out of her cage, right? I mean, we're not going to bring her in here at the point of sale. It doesn't mean we don't have that resource. And I said, I guess it all boils down. And this is where the one-liner part comes in. I said, I guess it all just boils down to whether or not you want to be best in class or you're willing to settle for the agencies or the resources that an agency can afford. And he said, well, what do you mean by that? I was like, well, I mean, what you're telling me is great, you know, but it's window dressing. In case you didn't know, the absolute best loss control people aren't going to go work for an insurance agency for what an agency can afford to pay them. You know, I said, it's not like the best um, industrial hygienists or claims people are going to go work for what an agency can afford them, afford to pay them. So the best loss control people open up consulting companies and they work for a thousand dollars a day and they make their own schedule. And so 
I made the decision when I launched Florida Risk Partners that I was only willing to deliver best in class experiences to my clients and prospects. And as a result, I wasn't going to go and hire people that I could afford. I wanted to have the flexibility of bringing in the best in class people specifically for the needs of my clients and prospects. And as a result, I have those people on retainer. If I want somebody to come in and do loss control visits for you, you need to understand it's not somebody that my agency can afford. I have a guy that spent 20 years as the risk manager for a mattress manufacturer in High Point, North Carolina, that understands exactly what your business does. And I can bring that guy in here to troubleshoot, and he's going to get the job done way better than a guy that's going to turn around and go visit a Chuck E. Cheese franchise later this afternoon and possibly a dry cleaning facility sometime tomorrow. Who do you want? Do you want the people that are going to push the envelope and make you best in class? Or do you want somebody that's going to come in here, check the boxes and let you stay where you're at? Ultimately, it's up to you as to whether or not you want to be motivated, motivated to perform at a different level. I'm getting pissed now just saying it, man. <laughs> and the, guy, Listen, and the we, guy comes back to me and he says, you know what? I completely misjudged. You're right. We want to move forward. Yeah. Well, we, we have... We have somebody on retainer for a thousand bucks a day. I mean, that's what it costs. That's what we have. It's a thousand dollars a day. And period. So, and so, if I send somebody from my company, it's a thousand dollars that we're paying for them to go meet with them, meet with some. I mean, it may be a one day OSHA audit, or it may be uh, something that's ongoing. But getting fifty thousand dollar revenue deals, then then it totally makes sense. So I, I've got a good one. All right. Um, one of the largest accounts in our agency is, a, is an employee benefits account. All right, we were working on this thing, and they were actually in a, in a PEO. They were in total source, and they were getting crushed on the admin fee. Um, so they were coming out, and we were having to, to take care of the benefits. There's and, a shocker. <laughs> yeah, so they were coming out. We had to apply the old ERM-6, and... Uh, <laughs> And <laughs> big fan of the ERM six. So we had to do that, to, you know, on the comp side, but but on the benefits. So again, this is this account, you know, seventy thousand plus in revenue. Um, we were competing against one of the ABC houses, and they brought them a hundred and sixty seven pages of reports. And, and this is on their benefits, 167 pages of reports and, you know, and all different kind of stuff like that. And the by the way, they thought they were adding value, right? They thought, well, we're going to go in, we're going to give them 167 pages. They can't, they, they can't help but hire us because yeah. we're obviously very thorough and detailed in everything we do. Here's a fun fact, people. You just confused the living crap out of somebody. Yeah. If you're leaving 167 report, pages of reports, if you can't say what you need to say in two or three pages at the most – then don't go and talk to them. Don't, don't even waste your time because you don't even know what you're doing well enough to boil it down to articulate it to the average decision maker. Yeah, so, so the CFO of the company, he, he was, uh, was kind of slick, and he sent me this proposal um, from these folks. And I looked at it, and, and I called him that night. I said, dude, I can, I, will, I can never recreate this. And so he was like, well, don't try. So I went the exact opposite, David. I went and got a... Because then, you know, there's no blocking in, in health insurance, right? So I, I went and, and I got a big legal size sheet of paper. It was one piece of paper, and I put everything on one sheet, and I handed it to them. And I said, as I understand it, your other proposal is 167 pages, and 166 pages of that shit don't matter, right? <laughs> and there's only one page that does. So I thought just to be easy, I would bring you one page and I would leave all that other shit that doesn't matter out. And, and dude, they just erupted in laughter. Like it was just like, I mean, I thought they were going to hug my neck. They were like, thank God that you did not bring four people in suits in here and, and bring us all this stuff and talk about your capabilities for two hours. Thank you for just bringing us what you're going to do, the plan, right? And our, and our whole plan was just based around making the HR manager's life easy because we had to replace the payroll system too. So we fully replaced it with the HRI, HRIS system, payroll system, you know, all the benefits, all the workers' compensation. 
and they're so thankful that we were able to do that. But I just thought it was a pretty good line, one liner that, that got yeah, the well, room laughing. So to that point, though, that's that's the thing. Like <clears throat> when I go in, and, and the PEO thing is what's you know jogged my memory. But I, one of the things I always tell people is I'm the guy that d- delivers what everybody else promises, right? That's the number one thing that PEOs do is they go in and they, they want to talk about, but we have HR, but we have HR, but we have HR. Now you know why we have mineral slash the old think HR for those of you that are like me and still haven't adapted to the new name yet. It's why we have mineral in the arsenal. I can go in and take a PEO out at the knees at any time I want because I've got a robust HR platform myself and I can go in and get them the bare bones payroll. I mean, you don't need HR support from your payroll company if you can get it on a product that's dedicated to you and with, with all of the resources that, that Mineral has. And so that's one of the reasons why we have that. It's easy to go take a PEO out of an equation at that point because typically you're going to get them a dividend when they didn't have one. Typically, they're going to get a better deal overall on the workers' comps. You're going to be able to get them the credits that they're not getting and everything else. But you're going to save them a ton of money on that admin fee, right? I mean, most places don't even know. And by the way, I'm going to give you guys a really good tip about selling PEO. If you're going to sell for it or you're going to sell against it, let me give you a really good tip right now. Don't ever sell a deal that's based on a percentage admin. Negotiate a flat cost per employee for what it's going to be. If your PEO says they don't do it, they're lying to you. If they still say they don't do it, then you have the wrong PEO relationships because all of the good ones will do that. They just don't advertise it. Why? Well, I don't know. Do you really want to cap what a doctor pays an admin for their practice at um, a flat amount? Or do you want the different physicians' payrolls to roll in there, especially when they bonus out at the end of the year and everything else? You get paid way more money for the same amount of work. But it doesn't mean it's an equitable arrangement. So, you know, you can go in and you can talk about negotiating a flat fee for the admin. The same thing holds true if you're trying to sell PEO. Maybe this is one of those classifications that you're going to have a difficult time getting placed. Or the mod's just gotten to the point where it makes more sense for them to roll into a PEO, let you work with them on the risk management side a little bit, get their processes and the behaviors in line, and then roll them back out when time comes. But you can also negotiate getting that flat deal done for your client if they're in a PEO, right? So I can sell against a PEO by bringing them out and just putting them on payroll. And I also put a flat, per, flat, flat dollar amount per employee per month on the payroll charge. Because if they, if they make overtime, why, why should that doesn't cost the payroll company any more money. If they get a raise. Yeah, that doesn't cost the payroll any more company any more money. Yeah. I want a flat fee. But if you go in and you see they're with a the PEO and you want to move them to one, you can say, well, we work with XYZ PEO, and they just put our people on a flat fee instead of percentage. Do you realize how much you're spending? I can save you $50,000 a year just in that, and you're telling me you need the HR because you're understaffed. I just got you a second professional person that, to, to work in your department with the money you saved just on the admin piece. We haven't even gotten to the comp and the benefits and everything else. And I'm not trashing PEOs. There's a place for them. But, you know, I can sell for them and I can sell against them. And a lot of it all boils down to the fact that you just need to know what that admin charge looks like, period. What's the highest admin fee that you've ever seen? I've seen one in double digits before. Me too. I think, I don't know, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I do want to say that it was like 13.5% or something like that. And yes, it was on a, on a medical practice. Well, so the one that I had uh, was was on a paint distribution company, and, and they had been in a PEO for many years, and it was ten point six percent on on like two million in payroll. I mean, it was it was just astronomical. I mean, it was like paying two hundred thousand dollars in in admin fees, and I remember the as we were going through the process, one of the things that the guy said, he said, well, you got my admin fee lowered to 5.3 or something like that. I was just like, dude, this, they're crushing you, man. They're just, they're just crushing you. But Hey, I've got accounts and PEOs. I I mean, I'm not saying it's always a bad thing. I mean, just like you, um, some higher hazard stuff, 
that's uh, got potential, but it's a startup. I mean, sometimes it has to go that route. Sometimes the mod gets so bad. Yeah, but to but to your point, I mean, those admin fees can get out, get out of control quickly. All right, man. Well, I think we gave them enough. These are two solid episodes we recorded today, and I got a doctor's appointment to find out if they're going to cut this football off the side of my rib cage sometime Whoa. soon. So I'm going to meet with the surgeon here in a little bit. So that's how my weekend's starting out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, my, my weekend is uh, is going to be filled with my son's birthday party. He turned six on July 9th. We took him and my daughter to the beach for a couple of days. And then tomorrow we got the bouncy house coming. We got all the ice cream and all the candy and all the stuff, and we're gonna have a ball. At a boy, that's exactly what you should be doing. All right, man. Have a good weekend, everybody else. Have a good weekend. We will. been listening to power producers shop talk you can follow us at the power producers podcast on facebook and instagram and if you want to take your game to the next level check out our commercial insurance training course at killingcommercial.com or visit amazon to pick up a copy of our international best-selling book the extra two minutes